Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here. And welcome. Yeah, New person. Yay. What's yeah. your name? Sadi. Sadi? Sadi in Spanish. I'm from Portugal. Sadi. Oh, welcome. Mucho gusto. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we were just here, uh, I see Paul Sokol and Robert Dine Lund, who accompanied Julie and I to the very first Native American Bearing Witness Retreat uh, seven years ago. Can't believe that time has flown by. Yeah, and Zen, we say appreciate each moment because it goes fast. <laughs> Although uh, we've been kind of on Indian time, which is a little slower there, Indian time. So I wanted to start with a poem by a Native American, N. Scott Mamaday. And he is a writer, and he won the Pulitzer for a fiction a piece called House Made of Dawn in 1969. And uh, he's a Kiowa. Uh, and this is the delight song of Soai Tali. Soai Tali. And um, that could be him, Soai Tali. Anyway. I am a feather on the bright sky. I am the blue horse that runs in the plain. I am the fish that rolls shining in the water. I am the shadow that follows a child. I am the evening light, the luster of meadows. I am an eagle playing with the wind. I am a cluster of bright beads. I am the farthest star. I am the cold of dawn. I am the roaring of the rain. I am the glitter on the crust of the snow. I am the long track of the moon in a lake. I am a flame of four colors. I am a deer standing away in the dusk. I am a field of sumac and the palm blanche. I am an angle of geese in the winter sky. I am the hunger of a young wolf. I am the whole dream of these things. You see, I am alive. I am alive. I stand in good relation to the earth. I stand in good relation to the gods. I stand in good relation to all that is beautiful. I stand in good relation to the daughter of Tsen Taint. You see, I am alive. I am alive. This is the delight song of Tsoai Tali. And I wanted to share that because yesterday we had a, a remarkable poetry and meditation workshop with Anne Erringhaus. Um, and she shared this poem, this delight song of Tsoai Tali. And, um, it's so much, um, is so much the same to our Zen, our Zen uh, teachings of oneness and interconnectedness. There's no duality. I am a feather on the bright sky. I am the blue horse that runs in the plain. So, that beautiful culture is what we experienced uh, on this uh, 2022 Bearing Witness Retreat. And I wanted to just give a little brief 
background about these Bearing Witness retreats that Bernie Glassman, who was Maizumi um, Roshi's first successor out of Zen Center of Los Angeles, our mother temple, and Maizumi Roshi um, founded that temple. And Bernie was quite a unique individual, and I know um, some of us met him. He was there at the, the first Native American Bearing Witness Retreat seven years ago. But at age 55, this was in January 1994, he decided to do a retreat because he had some questions about his life in regard to practice. And they, there's a picture, famous picture of them sitting in a circle near the steps of the Capitol in DC in the snow. And this is the questions that he was asking himself, how to bring Zen into our life. But Zen is life. What is there to bring? And into what? The point is to see life as the practice field, to see life as the practice field. Every aspect of our life has to become practice. What forms can we create in modern society that will be conducive to seeing the oneness of life. What are the forms that will make it easier to experience interconnectedness? Right, so we're bringing it from the intellectual right into our everyday life. That is what we have been working towards here at our Zen Center. How do we bring this oneness of life and interconnection into our practice? So this is what Bernie was asking himself as he sat in retreat, cold in the snow, bearing witness to his own questions. And at age 55, what was he going to do now? And he had, you know, a very uh, traditional upbringing with Maizumi Roshi. And now it was time he was uh, finishing. He, I think he finished with Maizumi Roshi. And he was seeing now, how does the practice come alive? So um, the three tenets arose from this. Actually, he and Jishu Holmes, both are on our founder's altar now. Uh, they were actually on vacation in Hawaii, on Maui, where they were thinking about these, these three tenets. They developed them and also the Zen Peacemaker Order, what became the Zen Peacemaker Order. And the three tenets, which are also foundational here at our center, is to practice not knowing, right? Letting go of fixed ideas about the world, about ourselves, letting go. And then bearing witness to what then arises when you, when you let go like that. What, what, what is going on internally, as well as knowing what is going on externally. And if you can do those two tenets well, really practice them well, then some kind of loving action will arise. Loving, healing, compassionate action. And then Bernie and Eve attended um, a big interfaith gathering at Auschwitz. It was in 19, early 1996. And from that, uh, Bernie said he felt the overwhelming 
um, that he said, he was overwhelmed by the millions of voices he experienced at Auschwitz of, of the spirits who wanted to be remembered. And so he began, he with Eve and Jishu and a number of others began that first Auschwitz Bearing Witness Retreat in 1996, late 1996. And uh, Roshi said, I'm going, because <laughs> he was also studying with Bernie, because Maizumi Roshi had just died. Uh, and I was like, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going to Auschwitz, no way. But he's going, and then after a while, it's like, why am I not going? Right? I'm definitely afraid, that's for sure. I realized that. And I said, well, that's why I should go. And um, so now it's been 26 years that they have been doing this annually there at Auschwitz. And uh, Anne Ehringhaus, who helped to lead the writing workshop yesterday, she and I met at that Auschwitz Bearing Witness Retreat 26 years ago. She was a body worker, Reiki master. We exchanged Reiki. and the old hospital that had been transformed into a hotel. <laughs> it was intense to be there. We needed that Reiki. And so seven years ago, Genro, also who studied with uh, Maizumi Roshi and then with Bernie Glassman, uh, together with Bernie, uh, started this Native American Bearing Witness Retreat. And Genro had been uh, in relationship with the Lakota, I think, several years before. I think he went on this huge, there was a horseback memorial ride to uh, Minnesota. Yes, Roshi? Uh, I, I can tell you a, a little bit of the story about how that... Okay, uh, please. <laughs> During our um, retreat this time, I was at, I, I was, first of all, I was expressing my gratitude to Genro for having set up these uh, bearing, Native American bearing witness retreats. And it all happened because he built relationships with Lakota elders over time. You know, they don't generally trust white folks like us. So it takes a lot of, a lot of doing for them to, to build those kind of relationships. And he told me, that during the early years of the Auschwitz retreats, they realized he he and Bernie realized that the Native Americans had a huge uh, spiritual tradition that wasn't being uh, wasn't being uh, wasn't present at Auschwitz because no one from that culture was coming to Auschwitz, but people from a lot of other religions were, you know, Catholics, Christians, Jews, Muslims, whatever. So Genro uh, calls up. As an elder, he doesn't even know who he's talking to, but it was someone actually quite high up in the Lakota, you know, spiritual lineage. And and he asks this guy, he says, "We really want someone from your. We want. I want you to come to. Uh, I'm inviting you to come to this bearing witness retreat at Auschwitz." And the the fellow said something like, "Well, I can't come myself, but I'll send someone in my place." So he sent. Uh, a Lakota person to an out, the Auschwitz retreat. And then after that, Kenro realized that they had just sent a really big gift, you know, to to the uh, peacemaker community for their retreat in Auschwitz. And it, they had to, re there had to be some kind of reciprocity for that. They had to give something back. And so Genro then uh, came out to, um, I think it was the Pine Ridge, and I think it was with Wendell, um, Yellow Bowl, right? And this was way before seven years before this all these retreats started. And Genro did a two week ride with uh, Lakotas at out of Pine Ridge. And Genro said after that he was hooked. He was just totally um, into the Native American culture. And and Genro, being who he is, he built really solid relationships with the Lakotas over the years that allowed us to have these kind of Native American retreats because 
and and these elders don't sit down and and talk to white people like us. This just does not happen. So the fact that the Zen the Zen peacemakers have been able to build the trust with Lakota elders enough so that we could have these retreats is in itself quite an accomplishment. Right. So I believe that memorial ride was from Pine Ridge all the way to Minnesota, yeah. where there was a mass hanging of 38 Native Americans. I believe that uh, President Lincoln yeah. uh, ag agreed to and I forget the circumstances, but they do a memorial ride uh, on horseback, and um, which is, you know, yeah, yeah quite um, to be on a horse also for that long is quite amazing. So these, um, so Roshi. Annie, who's online now, and Julie and I went to the one that just happened. And so they'll be, please interject whenever you feel, you know, we're kind of all talking about the experience together. I think the mass hanging was over the death of a cow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. So um, on the Zen Peacemakers website, you know, to do a bearing witness retreat is an intense kind of thing to do. And so uh, to practice these three tenets together. So they have a really wonderful, what they call ethical guidelines to follow if you're going to do one of these uh, retreats. And I just picked out, th there's not that many, but I picked out a few that were really uh, interesting to me. And they're all based on Buddhist precepts and the Eightfold Path. The first is, you know, accountability. They're really working to cultivate a space where all voices and opinions are heard. Uh, and diversity of individual experiences are affirmed and encouraged. You know, they're creating a safe space for everyone. And they really ask that people take responsibility for themselves and the retreat, kind of looking out for how you're doing as well as how others are doing. Transparency is another value uh, that's crucial, crucial for maintaining balance and harmony. And they say you should speak out on matters that if left unaddressed, you know, could foster doubt, suspicion, or resentment. So self-awareness is really imp important. And knowing that the retreat may be arduous to both mind and body, they ask that you really take responsibility for monitoring and caring for yourself. And right speech is an important uh, value. They say mutual respect manifests when we treat each other with dignity and engage with everyone truthfully and compassionately. Harmony is promoted when I observe right speech, refraining from lies, self-serving talk, slander, or apportioning blame. It also includes proactively and skillfully speaking out in a manner that respects all persons involved. Recognizing the potency of anger, I will practice self-awareness and endeavor to express myself openly and generously without blame or rejection. So what, what Deep, what a deep way to practice, right? We're coming up with things um, that are difficult. So there were five days, and um, we were initially in the beautiful Spearfish Canyon that's part of the Black Hills, just a beautiful place. This is where, 
where they film the ending of Dances with Wolves. <laughs> you know, it's just so gorgeous there, absolutely gorgeous. And on the first day, we met the elders, Manny and Renee Ironhawk. Manny is a tall uh, Native American. Both are fluent in Lakota. Uh, we met Violet Catches, who is a healer, and Wendell Yellowbull, who is the nephew of Red Cloud who was a great chief that was important in that 1868 treaty where the U.S. government gave the Lakota the Black Hills forever. But a few years later, gold was discovered in them thar hills, and they just kind of took back. Uh, they did not honor the treaty. So, um, that first day, Manny and Renee, Manny mainly, shared a couple of cons, uh, teachings about their way of life. Two words in particular, Wo Lakota and Tiosh Paye. And Wolakota is the people's sacred way of life, about the wholeness of life, harmony, peace, balance, coming together, which is so much our Zen way of life, how we see the world as well. And then the other word was Tioshpaye, which is the word for extended family or kinship. And it's not just kinship with humans, so that is very important, but kinship with animals, with plants, the thunder beings, nature. Uh, so it was how to be a human being, how to be kind and generous to your relatives, Tiosh um, Paye. Yeah, how to be a good relative. <laughs> be a good relative. In the final analysis, he says, Manny says, every other consideration was secondary. Property, personal ambition, glory, good times, life itself. Tioshpaye, the kinship, the relationship with your relatives was what was really important, and your children. So, Parents, grandparents were setting the example of these values because he said children are watching all the time and they are learning all the time. You know, how to walk the red road, they say, which is connected to everything, the trees, the grasses, grandmother earth. We are connected. Everything is alive. Oh, yes, also um, community governance was also accomplished through consensus with all concerned parties being able to speak and be heard. Uh, Manny actually started out with a couple of stories. He, he is an amazing storyteller. He goes around to the schools and tells stories about Iktomi, this trickster spirit kind of, that's a spider, but it can take the form of anything, including humans. Um, and it's a way for them to pass on values to their children. And there's a couple of great stories, and I think I'll need some help on this, but Iktomi was climbing up uh, like a canyon, and then he came to a beautiful big pool, 
and he saw himself, and he looked pretty good, <laughs> you know, looking. Saw it. And then, and then he saw some choke cherries in there too. So the story, the way they, Manny tells it is like, you know, he he's gonna go after those choke cherries. So he makes this beautiful Olympic style dive, <laughs> goes up and he jumps in and he's looking around and there's no choke cherries in there. So he comes out again and then he makes another beautiful dive to get those choke cherries, no choke cherries, because the choke cherries, that was just a reflection. The choke cherries were the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's another story about Iktomi that's really great. So Iktomi, he comes and he sees this big herd of elk, you know, and he's kind of hungry and he wants to be an elk. And he sees this particular one that's really big and buff and, you know, he goes, I want to be that elk. And some of the other, um, elk there said, oh no, you don't want to be that elk. No, you don't want to be, oh yeah, I want to be that elk. <laughs> so through somehow he manages to become that elk. And he's kind of eating all this grass, you know, they got this you know, big mouthful of this dry grass that he's eating and, and he's happy. Well, come to find out that elk is real old and <laughs> he's gonna die like soon. <laughs> and so he kind of got into the wrong elk. So these kind of <laughs> wonderful stories, right, that uh, they share, um, he shares, Manny shares with the schools. So that was the first day. And then the second day, is when Manny shared about Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee Massacre. And he, he and Violet are descendants of survivors of the Wounded Knee Massacre. There was some, um, well, let me tell you how he told it, because I was taking a lot of notes on that day, which was interesting to me, because I forgot my notebook like most of the other days, but that day I took. And um, he says that Sitting Bull resided on the Grand River at Standing Rock, and the ghost dances were starting to happen because, you know, the native peoples were really in a bad way. They were on reservations. The government, the US government was cutting their rations and they, the buffalo were pretty much all wiped out. So they had no way to be self-sustaining and they were being herded onto these reservations with the promise that the US government would give them supplies so they could live. Well, they kept cutting it or because of, you know, what, are you, what is it called? Graft and, you know, at that level that the food was not getting to the natives. So they were getting <clears throat> in a very bad way. <clears throat> So they were starting, there was a contingent that said the ghost dances were one way that everything would be fine. So just, you just have to dance. And so they were dancing, but the, the government agents thought, well, maybe that would be a prelude to armed uprising. So they were afraid. And so, so anyway, the agent, McLaughlin, ordered the arrest of Sitting Bull because Sitting Bull was very revered amongst his people. And they went, they took 40 Indian police and they went to his home, the Grand River, and were going to arrest him. But he asked, you know, why am I being arrested? and did a little bit of resistance, and at which point some chaos ensued, and he was actually shot by two Indian agents and killed. And as a result, that 
uh, led to a lot of turmoil amongst the people. And Spotted Elk, who is also known as Bigfoot, took one group south to Wounded Knee Creek. I think there were about 500 maybe that went there. And um, it was winter right after uh, the death of Sitting Bull. And they were trying, the military, the cavalry was trying to disarm the Lakota because they did have guns. They went even so far, they wanted to, they wanted to even take the women's awls that they used for uh, whatever, you know, cooking or, uh, they, they, they came and they took as much as they could. They also had four Hotchkiss guns, like Gatling guns that they surrounded the encampment with. And evidently there was one deaf uh, Native American man who did not want to give up his gun and didn't really, it's not clear, but didn't really seem to understand what was going on. And so I think unknowingly he fired a shot and that caused a whole panic to happen. And the, you know, they were disarming the Indians and uh, the men, and then the, the Hotchkiss guns started shooting everybody there. And some Native Americans tried to resist, but I don't know how many bullets a, a Hotchkiss gun can uh, shoot, but I think it's a lot. So he says, uh, chaos and crying happened. Um, a 10-year-old grandmother survived, and his grandfather, I think, wrote it down in Lakota, also survived. He said, imagine you're in camp when shots rings, rings, rings out, and grandma comes and grabs you by the hand. Let's run down to the ravine as fast as we can. All the while, shots were ringing out by the guns. The men did what they could. Grandma and child ran down the ravine and came to a cave and ran to it. There were people in there already. Grandpa Ghost Horse said, I have to go back out there and help as much as I can. And his son wanted to go too, but the people said, stay, stay. But the son wanted to go. So he went and um, with Grandpa Ghost Horse, and then only Grandpa Ghost Horse returned, and all the people cried. They killed my son, he said. A little while later, Grandpa said, I have to go out there, and he never returned. So the white soldiers hunted them down in a five mile radius and killed anyone that they found, just shot them dead. Grandma got away with the others and they kept going past this five mile radius. I mean, they just kept going. Uh, two brothers ran all the way back to Cheyenne River, which is about 40 miles. Uh, American Horse has this testimony here. There was a woman with an infant in her arms who was killed as she almost touched the flag of truce. A mother was shot down with her infant. The child, not knowing that its mother was dead, was still nursing. The women, as they were fleeing with their babies, were killed together, shot right through. And after most all of them had been killed, a cry was made that all those who were not killed or wounded should come forth and they would be safe. Little boys came out of their places of refuge, and as soon as they came in sight, a number of soldiers surrounded them and butchered them there. 
And Black Elk had this, he was a medicine man uh, for the Oglala Lakota, he said. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. And I, to whom so great a vision was given in my youth, you see me now a pitiful old man who has done nothing, for the nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. He just died in 1950. So, uh, Manny said, you know, his dream didn't die. We're carrying it now to be a whole people again. He just lost his mother. Uh, he, Manny lost his mother in 2008. And so he got active to, do, to see what he could do with the other descendants of the survivors. And she, he said, when my mother told the story, she would cry and it made me sad. Healing's got to start somewhere, here, now. Forgiveness is hard to do. We have been in contact with the Hotchkiss family, descendants of the commander at Wounded Knee. One young man was angry and said, we can't do this but deep in your heart where dreams live, you know you have to take that step where flowers bloom again. Take small steps and meet again to work on this. Uh, he said when he met that uh, member of the Hotchkiss family and told him what happened, this member could not sleep. And he had to come to this descendants meeting that I guess is of descendants, both uh, survivors and perpetrators, just like uh, at Auschwitz. We want to have both come together, kind of a healing. So after that wounded knee, a blizzard came <clears throat> the next day. And then after the blizzard, um, the cavalry soldiers, you know, were cleaning, they hired people to clean up, and evidently they took a lot of items from that, uh, including body parts and skulls. Uh, evidently, the FBI has over 500,000 pieces of these artifacts or relics. And so Manny, one of the things that he is trying to do is trying to get them back to the Lakota people so that they can do ceremonies, and he says, so their ancestors can go back to the Milky Way. Sensei? Yeah. Excuse me, there's, you know, you're gonna run out of time. There's no way to tell the whole story of this retreat. <laughs> Right, right. Thank you. It was just too much, too many things to say. Uh, and I would suggest you just give a moment for Julie and Annie to say, tell a story about their experience of the retreat. But maybe you can have another uh, talk on Sunday mornings and to tell more about this story. It's a really important story, but we're just going to run out of time. Thank you, thank you, yes. Um, Julie and Annie, because I also have a slideshow that's 10 minutes long, I wanted to show you as well. <laughs> I'm run out of time. So <laughs> Annie and uh, Julie, go ahead and share whatever you would like. Um, okay, sure. Uh, I would just say um, two big things is, um, one, this didn't happen during the retreat. This happened after when I was emailing with Violet to check my spelling. 
she said that Lakota is actually like the more like a white way to say it. Uh, if you want to say it in, in Lakota, you say it more like with a like a like Bach has like a sound. So it's like Lakota, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on it, but that's one thing. And she also spells it with an X to like mark it phonetically, L-A-K-X-O-T-A. And uh, because it's like an oral language, there's lots of different ways to spell things because of the different, um, you know, orthographies. And then the second thing is that um, a tip on talking with Native Americans that I figured out was you kind of have to say the stuff that you are thinking and feeling that you think is obvious. You have to like say it out loud to them so they know who they're, you know, who, who you are. Uh, like uh, we met this woman who is a spirit runner who does like jogs for water in long distances. And she was kind of like, um, I experienced her as being kind of dismissive of me and like not really very friendly. And I was like, oh, maybe you have to actually say it out loud. And I was like, hey, what you're doing is so inspiring. And, uh, and then she like became friendly right away. Oh, how about you, Annie? Oh, you're muted, Annie, muted. Thank you so much for your wonderful relaying of the stories and the depth of that experience, which is still with me. Um, I just wanted to say about the, um, Tiyoshbai, in the beginning, there were 30 of us who attended, men and women, probably as much, half and half. I don't know, I didn't count. But everybody there grew to a family kind of union. And when we'd sit around in the circle, there would be people on the ground, people on chairs, people standing. And we would sit there for like five hours a day listening to these stories. And even though, unlike the first retreat I went to where we were working on projects for humanity and helping build houses or going to various sites that had developed for teenage activities, this was mostly a kind of sitting and listening retreat. And believe me, it was hard. It was really hard for me to take in all these stories. And June took such beautiful notes um, I can't even remember some of the things that she was talking about. It was so, so deep and powerful. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, Violet Catches um, emphasized the matriarchal structure of the Native American Indian society, that it was the elder women who made all the major decisions about everything. And it wasn't until their society was dis destroyed, that they took on the more patriarchal system of governance. Um, and these objects that were displayed in the museum that June alluded to about taking the, taking the remnants from Wounded Knee, they, were, they are still in this museum in Massachusetts. And um, I was thinking, during the retreat, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know, because Bernie used to say, well, just because the retreat is over, don't think, oh, I'm great now. I can go home and forget about it. This was like, no, man, this was the beginning. And so I got really nervous about what can I do? And, and I had some ideas and one of them was to write letters. So I wrote a letter to the Barre Museum and I have to mail it tomorrow. It'll take a while to get there because I'm not in the States, but um, every little bit helps. And there was a wonderful article in the Washington Post by a Native American journalist who outlined the story about all of the remnants, the, the moccasins, the um, baby carriers and the peace pipes that were found after Wounded Knee and that were sold to people and then variously 
various ways made their way into the museum. And this is what the elders were saying, they would like them back because the, the souls of the ancestors can't rest until they have them. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And, and I think the other is that, you know, to try and educate myself as much as possible and to realize that, yeah, it's the Indians who taught us, the Native Americans who taught us how to live. They knew how to live in nature and where, where else to learn about how to save the planet than through their culture, through their language. And um, that is just so important right now. It's like, we're desperate, we're desperate and we need, we need to know how to heal the earth and ourselves. And I think they can teach us so much. Annie, that was a nice letter you wrote. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you got it. <laughs> I thought it was a good letter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the young people there, they have huge problems with alcoholism and drug addiction because their culture was destroyed. You know, their whole connectedness to their roots is taken away. And what did they have left but, you know, despair and hopelessness. So they're trying now to really gather the people together and to give them their respect back and their wisdom of the thousands of years of of knowledge of how to live with Mother Earth. And, you know, the buffalo, <clears throat> the buffalo was their major source of food and living. They used every part of that animal when it was killed and they only took what they needed. They didn't slaughter heedlessly like the white man did. <clears throat> they would take the buffalo to the edge of the cliff and they would um, kind of nudge them off so that they, they died by falling off the hill, they didn't shoot them. And they used the skin for their tents and they used the meat for their livelihood, for their food. And the hooves were all used in a very environmentally safe way. Um, Violet used to identify, she would say that, you know, we are two-legged creatures, the animals are four-legged and the plants and the trees are one-legged. And we're all connected. We're all deeply connected to this wonderful world. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Roshi, did you have something? Yeah, I could share. I, I wrote about it in my blog, but I could share one story that my ex experience of the retreat was it was very difficult for me physically, but it was also difficult mentally. And I almost from the beginning, I felt guilty. Um, I felt like I'm coming from the culture that did great harm to these beautiful Native Americans. I, I'm from that culture. I'm a white guy. And I felt guilty right away from the first that we got there. And then these people are so gracious in, uh, in spite of my awkwardness. Uh, and, and Wendell, who was one of the elders, Wendell Yellowbow, I, I was fair, quite awkward around because I said, you know, I just didn't know what to say to him. I'm, I'm not exactly a I don't know. I, I was awkward around Wendell the whole retreat. So at the at the end of the when we were all going around shaking each other's hands, I went up to Wendell and I said, I shook his hand and I said, you know, you probably don't like me very much, but it's okay. I'm really grateful for all the things I learned from you this week. And uh, and we just both kind of looked at each other, shocked, and uh, that was it. And then. The next morning when we were saying our final goodbyes, we were in the breakfast room and people were shaking hands again and, you know, saying goodbyes. And I saw, I was shaking people's hands and I saw Wendell across the room in the breakfast room and I, I waved to him, but I, again, there was this awkwardness I had with Wendell. And, um, 
and that was sad. And then June and me drove off. We were to go home and we got about 10 miles away from the motel. And the, the further we got away from the motel, the, the worse I felt. And I was just very emotional and uh, crying. And uh, I just felt like I was not Wola Kota at that point. I was out of balance. I, I couldn't, I felt bad because I didn't go over and shake his hand. And it seemed like at that moment, it was really disrespectful that I hadn't. So I turned the car around and I told Sensei that I had to go back and shake <laughs> Wendell's hand. I mean, no, I'm sure Wendell didn't care one way or the other, but it meant something to me that I hadn't. So if I felt like that was not Wolakota, that I, I, I hadn't shaken his hand. It was disrespectful from my point of view. I was being, so I drove all the way back. I'm crying like an idiot. And he's no longer in the breakfast room. He's in his room. I get his room number. I go up and knock on his door. He opens the door and there I am standing like an idiot crying. I said, uh, you know, I didn't shake your hand this morning and that was disrespectful. And I shook his hand and I said, I may not know what to say to you, I'm awkward when I'm around you, but I will never disrespect you. And I, and I, and that, that, you know, shaking his hand and I still didn't know what to say to him. So I turned around and walked back to the car and drove off. But the second time I drove off, I felt like at least I was Wola <laughs> but I was, I was really emotional. And uh, it was a hard retreat for me. I, it was hard physically and mentally for that reason but I felt like I learned a lot about not only Lakota, but I learned something about myself as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I have a 10 minute slideshow, but I kind of want to see if there are any questions also that anyone has. We might have to go a little over the time today, but are there any questions? Maybe a, a couple of few minutes. It's okay, if... we're on Indian time. That's right, we're on Indian time. <laughs> Out of time. <laughs> oh. Julie, can you handle the uh, the other thing too, or Shikan, where are you? <laughs> I'm up here. Yeah. Oh yeah, that thing. I I wondered whether you and Robert have been to the retreat every year of the seven years or not. No, this is the first, uh, the second for me, and the first for Robert. Thank you. I wanted to uh, reflect on what you were saying, Robert, about my own feelings when we were there. And I get emotional when I'm just talking about something that happened seven years ago. Um, but I was aware that <clears throat> The telling of stories that that seemed to be an important part of the Indian culture to share about something that we might get from them. And I'm not very good at telling stories. <clears throat> I don't know how else to reach out to a different culture, especially one where it's difficult to to look at them in there to have eye contact because that's not comfortable for them um so I, what you've mentioned just now roshi is uh, is still raw well i i think that they they told beautiful stories and they told painful stories as, as Sensei was talking about Wounded Knee was really just horrific and they told other painful stories too. There's a lot of trauma, but 
I think mostly we listened. And I think they actually appreciated the fact that we took the time to listen and we appreciated the fact that they took the time to, to tell us the stories about themselves. And I think it was that kind of, yeah, everyone told some stories in their own way, but most of it, I think we were really listening and trying to learn from them. Yeah. Just to end up here, I, I'm curious as to uh, what the letter looked like and that you sent to that museum. Is there a chance that we could see a copy of that? Of course. Yes, I'll send one. Sure. We'll get Thank it you. to you, uh, Diney. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Renee, Renee actually said uh, she was one of the elders. She said it was like heaven just to be listened to. So it, that felt really good to me. Yes, I, I think that somebody said they didn't realize how much they had to tell until they started talking. I think it was Violet who said that that you know they had they hadn't had that opportunity to really you know a full day of telling stories and people there surrounded listening respecting was really important and when we did get to visit they took us to two of their most sacred sites where we had the opportunity to offer prayers and prayer flags which I want to also um, make some and hang it on a tree in our backyard because that's what they do is they make it out of these four colors. They fill one corner in a ball with tobacco and then they all of this is in prayer right for peace for health for harmony, uh, which is what the whole retreat was about healing and then we tie it on the, on the tree so. So one of the, the second sacred place we went to is is known as Devil's Tower in Wyoming. But the course of Lakota have their own name for the place, which was an uh, Mato Tipila, which means the place of the Lodge of the Bear. And it's this, it's this huge uh, rock formation that just juts straight out of the earth. It's very dramatic. And it's been a sacred place to the Lakota for you know, long time, a long time before we were ever came upon the scene. And I was, asked, I think I asked Violet. I was sort of curious why it got the name Devil's Tower, and she said, and this was really telling. She said that the Native American, the Lakota, have many sacred places throughout the Black Hills and in Wyoming. And many of those sacred places have been renamed with English names that have devil in the name. And I thought, oh, that's really, that's really telling that Western Christians felt like they needed to rename the most sacred places to, of the Lakota with the name devil in it. And that just says, that says a lot right there about the kind, the level of genocide that we have committed against these people is, uh, it's just unimaginable what we've done to them. So um, it's a minute before 11 right now. So I'm gonna just show the slideshow and then if you need to leave, you can leave, but it'll be uh, recorded and um, uh, and then maybe we can do this another time because there's so much. Yes, Robin. Oh, you're muted. I just had a question. I wondered if um, Annie's letter, which I'm sure must be requesting that the relics be returned, mm -hmm. if it could be shared with the whole Sangha. And if we could then, uh, any of us who want to sign that, that we could do that and pass it on so that we are lending our support. Great, I think that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, uh, I think that 
you know, we'll ask Shikan. You'll send it out by email, I would imagine. Yeah. Thank you. You can also send the link to the slideshow, too, because I'm not sure how it'll come out, but thank you for that, Robin. All right, so are you ready for the slideshow? This is just some beautiful, uh, you'll see. Um, and at the end, there's another letter. Wounded Knee Cemetery.
very soon.
12 year old boy who just had his birthday and he was going to write a letter, which he did to President Biden, to ask if he would come and um, be a peace. Sculptor. I can't hear you, June. Sorry. You can't see me? Turn your volume up, Sensei. Hear me now? A little. Okay. Uh, anyway. Speak louder. Oh, okay. So anyway, at the very end there, uh, the 12-year-old boy, Ben Powers, wrote a letter uh, to President Biden asking him to come and smoke the peace pipe with Wendell <laughs> and to talk about relations. Uh, so that's the picture at the end. <laughs> Wendell is a holder of the peace pipe from that 1868 treaty, which is a great, really a big responsibility and a big honor to to be the holder of that pipe, which is a really special thing in their culture. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful slideshow. Thank you all, really appreciate your being here with us. <laughs> Thank you, that was beautiful, June. Thank you. Thank you for the whole morning. It was very yeah, lovely. That whole morning. I hope you will tell more from your, your written journal and ha have another morning to share. Great Sunday, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Annie <laughs> and Julie. <laughs> Thank you.